Pyrrhus arrived in Italy as a hero. He quickly became a tyrant in Tarentum and later in Sicily, and after Beneventum he left in disgrace and disappointment. The Pyrrhic Wars are the first major conflict the Romans ever fought, and the first piece of evidence that Rome would stand the test of time for almost a thousand years. Disgraced, lacking funds and accompanied by a crumbling army, Pyrrhus returned to Epirus. Antigonus II Gonatas had recently taken control of Macedon in 277 BC. He was a rival of Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus mustered what forces he could and struck Macedon, likely looking for funds and glories, something to erase his recent failures in Italy. In 274, he defeated Antigonus at the Battle of Aus and took most of Macedon. In 272, Cleonymus of Sparta, a Spartan royal who felt as though he should be king, requested aids to Pyrrhus so he could become the king of Sparta. Looking to expand his sphere of influence, Pyrrhus accepted. However, things quickly turned south as he met fierce opposition at the siege of Sparta, and when met by a relief force from Antigonus, Pyrrhus withdrew, losing his son Ptolemy in the fight. Months later, he intervened in a civil dispute in Argos and stormed into the city, only to meet his untimely death by brick to the head, thrown by an old lady. Hearing about the death of Pyrrhus, the Romans moved to seize Tarentum and southern Italy. Antigonus reclaimed his possessions and Sicily became the stage of a cold war between Carthage and Rome. But what if Pyrrhus had won the war? How could he have done it? Let's enter the alternate history realm and explore two scenarios. Caneas persuades Pyrrhus not to cross into Italy and Pyrrhus is able to decisively defeat Rome. Caneas was a formidable orator and diplomat of Pyrrhus. He had been the disciple of the great Demosthenes of Athens. It is likely he was in his 50s or even 60s during the Pyrrhic Wars. There is a famous episode where Kenias asks Pyrrhus what he will do after conquering his next empire. Pyrrhus eventually tells Kenias that after there is nothing left to conquer, he will rest. Kenias rebuffs this with, well, you can rest now. Why don't you simply rest now instead of going through all this trouble, only to end up resting later rather than now? While on our timeline, Pyrrhus ignores this and goes on to fight the Pyrrhic Wars. On this alternate timeline, he stays home. Although, this is quite unlikely due to Pyrrhus's undenying ambition to conquer an empire. In 279 BC, Ptolemy Caranus, ruler of Macedon and ally of Epirus, rushed to fight a Gallic invasion of Macedon. He is killed in battle and the country is left without a ruler. Despite not being popular among the Macedonians, Pyrrhus would move into Macedon to claim the throne once again. It is likely that the Ptolemies in Egypt would aid Pyrrhus in this effort, as they did in the Pyrrhic Wars. He defeats the Gallic Horde in 278 BC alongside the Greeks in Thermopylae, further cementing his rule of Macedon and keeping Antigonus II Gonatas with no seat of power. It is likely that Pyrrhus and Antigonus would eventually meet in a battle for Macedon, but as in our timeline, Pyrrhus would decisively defeat Antigonus. In 275 BC, Cleonymus of Sparta would still ask for the support of Pyrrhus to take the Spartan throne, but on this timeline, with a large, strong army and funds in his coffers, Pyrrhus is able to install Cleonymus as a puppet king and later take Argos by storm. The Eagle King evades the murderous roof tile and is in either direct or indirect control of Greece by 274 BC. On this timeline, Rome is able to take southern Greece by 275 BC as Pyrrhus doesn't invade Italy and doesn't give hope to the native populations. As such, a big Roman Tarentine war happens and the Romans are able to defeat Tarentum. This causes many to surrender and declare allegiance to the Eternal City. Carthage is likely to have been able to take Syracuse after a long siege and the Punic Wars might now happen earlier. Without the introduction of elephants by Pyrrhus to the west, Carthage would not have elephants in its army by the First Punic War. But could have Pyrrhus actually have defeated Rome in the Pyrrhic Wars? The simple answer is that this is a very unlikely scenario. For the Romans, ever since the sack of the city in 387 BC, all wars were wars of survival. Surrender was never an option, and the population held that same mindset, so much so that no matter the defeat or casualties, there would always be thousands of recruits ready to fill in the casualties. To defeat Rome was to strip Rome of its manpower pool. 
However, at the Battle of Heracli of 280 BC, Pyrrhus defeated Rome without its Italian allies. In our timeline, the Romans suffered over 10,000 casualties. If the Italian allies had joined Pyrrhus before the battle, Roman casualties would have been much higher and the Epirots much lower. Many cities in Italy, seeking their independence or simply waging their bets, would turn to the Epirot side, sending men to further bolster the Greek army. A second battle is likely to have occurred as the Romans still refused to surrender, but their efforts to rebuild the army would have been much higher. At this battle, the Romans would be at a numerical disadvantage and would likely suffer another decisive defeat. The term Pyrrhic victory would never exist as Pyrrhus would be able to lose only a modest amount of men. In Rome, the citizens panicked, fortifying the walls and the Capitoline Hill. As Pyrrhus marches on Rome, Kenius is sent in advance to offer peace. Pyrrhus is willing to release the Roman prisoners in exchange for peace and Epirus will become a friend of Rome. The Roman Senate discusses the proposal under a cloud of impending doom. After much talk, they accept Pyrrhus' proposal, renouncing all southern Italian possessions and making peace with the Greeks. Pyrrhus then turns to Carthage, setting sail to Sicily. Now, he has a larger manpower pool, but the Siege of Lilibium is still a failure. In this timeline, Pyrrhus doesn't need to tax the Sicilians, nor draw men from the Greek cities, and as such, he holds on to the title of Liberator. With his new fleet joining the large Syracusan fleet, he is able to set sail to Carthage. He lands in Africa and is able to take all towns around the capital, then laying siege to the city and blockading its ports. A long siege of Carthage would ensue. The results of such a siege is difficult to predict. I suspect that during the year or so that Pyrrhus is building his fleet, the Carthaginians would be recruiting, training and preparing Carthage for a siege. They know they're the Epirate target. Due to this, I believe the siege of Carthage would result in failure. Following the death of Ptolemy Coronas and the ascension of Antigonus, Pyrrhus would start worrying that his home of Epirus was in peril if he stood bogged down in a siege for much longer. Pyrrhus would thus try to cut a deal with Carthage and return to Greece to fight Antigonus and take Macedon. A deal is unlikely to happen, but I'll theorize that Kenias would have been able to strike a peace deal where Lilibaeum is given to the Epirates and Carthage is given some sort of monetary compensation. Upon arriving in Greece, Pyrrhus defeats Antigonus and takes Macedon, later the Peloponnese. But with great power come greater enemies, the Seleucid Empire would eventually come after Pyrrhus, starting the next great classical war. If you enjoyed this video, click like and spread it around. Here are some other videos that I think you will enjoy. Stay wonderful, I've been Wolf and I'll see you on the next one.